my name is Lana Marconi. I am a registered traditional Chinese medicine acupuncturist. I've had a clinic in Oakville for a few years now and I opened up first at 84 Lakeshore Road West in Oakville. During that time we had a big grand opening, we had the mayor there, several important people. It was fantastic. I, at the same time I was also teaching at the Canadian College of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Mississauga, supervising student clinics, teaching internal medicine to the students there and then I actually moved my clinic a few blocks into downtown Oakville at 118 uh, Thomas Street on the second floor. So that's where I am now. I'm no longer teaching at the college. I'm focused uh, solely on my clinical practice located in Oakville. Why did I get into acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine? Well, I guess it stems back when I was in my 20s. I was actually going to York University for a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. I met some students who were into meditation, and I'd never done it before. And I just sent this heartfelt prayer to the higher power, call it God, if you will, that I just want to be of service. And before I knew it, I was sitting in this lotus position that, you know, I never sat in before. And I felt this surge of energy just come in through what I later learned to be, you know, my crown chakra. And I felt like this waterfall of energy just trickling down into my body as energy and then igniting the energy at the base of my spine coming up. So I felt this flow of energy and it was like very eye-opening for me because I've never felt, uh, or at least to my knowledge, I've never actually felt energy moving inside of my body that I have been aware of. After that experience, which was beautiful, incredible, and filled with love and peace, I just every day I feel this energy moving in and out of my body. It's actually opened up uh, some of my higher human perceptual abilities, which that's something that they talk about in Sanskrit and in Hindu philosophy. At that time, though, I was interested not necessarily in traditional Chinese medicine, but more in the study of consciousness and energy and how our consciousness affects our energy and vice versa. And so after I finished my BA in psychology at York University, I actually continued um, onwards to a, a doctorate degree in transpersonal psychology or spiritual psychology in order to understand the relationship between our mind or our consciousness and the energy flowing inside of our bodies. It wasn't until really later on in life that I took up an interest in pursuing traditional Chinese medicine. It was in my late 30s, early 40s, and I went to a school in Markham, Ontario, Canada. It was a three-year program in traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture. I completed the program and I wrote my pan-Canadian license examination and I passed. And ever since then, I have been treating people with traditional Chinese medicine. In retrospect, like I went to school in Ontario, for example. so. Like I grew up in Sudbury, Ontario, and then my parents moved our family to Mississauga, Ontario um, when I was in grade eight. And so during my elementary and high school studies in Ontario, I was never taught about my energy system. I had no, no idea about it. Really what we're taught in health classes at, that, at those levels is Western medicine and the systems that Western medicine uses, like the, you know, the reproductive system, the circulatory system, the endocrine system. Never was there any mention about our energy body, our, our meridians, for example, or our acupuncture points. This is a sophisticated system that they've used for thousands of years in the East, but here in the West, it's not even included in our textbooks as part, as a fundamental part of our human anatomy. And so that's sad in a way when I look back now. It's like, wow, I really wish that I was taught about my energy body when I was going to high school. For example, you know, we have to read these textbooks about health and um, we just missed out. So hopefully now that more and more of uh, Eastern medicine is coming here to the West, to Canada and to the United States, that earlier generations, people in high school, will be able to learn about their energy system. When you think about it, you know, Western medicine actually uses energy diagnostic devices like the EKG, EEG, for example, and, and Western medicine also uses 
energy treatments such as laser to correct for eye vision. So Western medicine is actually utilizing energy, but yet their energy system is not taught in health classes. So where did this idea of our energy body, our energy system, where did it originate? I'm about to, or attempt to, take 2,000 years plus of knowledge and disperse it to you in this video. Keep in mind, this is like the tip of the iceberg in terms of traditional Chinese medicine. When you actually get into studying traditional Chinese medicine, there are layers of layers of layers of layers of knowledge and information. But right now, let's just take a journey, you and I, to the distant past and we will look at the origins of our energy body of traditional Chinese medicine and see how it evolved over the years. Now, I do ask that you take your Western logical mind and actually put it in a box for a moment because you really need to be open to the concepts in Eastern medicine. Now, the history of traditional Chinese medicine is, I think, shrouded in mystery, mysticism, and quantum leaps of consciousness. There are several heroes in the history of traditional Chinese medicine, and really we're not sure if these were real people or divine figures or some sort of supernatural entity. Meet Fusi. Here we see the first of many infusions of sophisticated knowledge into the minds of primitive people. According to legend, Fusi and his sister survived a great big flood. They retired to a mountain where they prayed for a sign from the Emperor of Heaven. The divine being approved their union and the siblings set about procreating the human race. Somewhat like the creation story of Adam and Eve in Christian mythology. Fusi and Nuwa, his sister, were often depicted as having human bodies and dragon tails that were intertwined and holding measuring instruments that represented yang, which is male, and yin, which is female, principles that permeate everything in the universe. Now the dragon tail is shaped as DNA. The yin and yang energies are the fabric underlining material DNA. Fusi is a Chinese legend, one of the greatest heroes of Chinese culture. He observed nature, formulated yin and yang with a broken line and unbroken line. These are two of the great powerful forces of nature, creation and reception. This is how the eight trigrams of how life is created from yin and yang. According to tradition, Fusi had the arrangement of the eight trigrams of the I Ching revealed to him supernaturally. The eight trigrams form the basis for the philosophy in the Book of Changes, the I Ching. The eight trigrams come together to form different arrangements, to form 64 hexagrams that represent all of life, everything in life, from mountains to rivers. Now this I Ching is used for divination purposes. People would consult the I Ching, and they still do today, to get answers in their lives. Everything is always changing in the universe. That's why it's called the Book of Changes. And when you consult the Book of I Ching, you're really asking for moral guidance, for direction, for questions that you want answers to on how to best live your life. So here we see the movement of a supernatural energy. Well, first, the mythological story of Fusi, was he real? We don't know. And then we see the idea that humans are to consult this divine energy, the book of changes, the I Ching, whereby yin and yang flow harmoniously, yet are oppositional forces, yet underlie the structure of reality. Moving along in the history of uh, Chinese medicine, we see Shenong. He is called the divine farmer. Suddenly now, well, back up for a minute. With Fusi, we saw the trigrams and the introduction of a writing system. With Shenong, the divine farmer, we see the introduction of agricultural ways, herbs now. It is said that Shenong would eat herbs to show people which herbs were good for you and which were not good for you, and that his stomach was see-through so people could see what these herbs were doing inside of his internal organs. Again, we're not sure if Shenong was a real human or a divine, supernatural being. Shenong, the divine farmer, introduced agriculture in the teachings of herbal medicine. 
The book Shenong's Great Herbal Classic was written in the Hong Dynasty and attributed to Shenong. He laid the foundation of the study of Chinese herbs. Ancient people ate grass and drank water. They frequently suffered from disease and poisoning. Then Shenong taught the people for the first time how to sow the five grains, to observe whether the land was wet or dry, fertile or rocky, located in the hills or in the lowlands. He tasted the flowers of all the herbs and taught people what to avoid and where they could go. Chinese literature credits Shenong with determining the medical properties of things by tasting them himself. Some version of the story gives Shenong a see-through stomach so folks could witness the effects of what he ate on his internal organs. In the Stone Age, people used stones. So whenever you had an injury, you would either rub yourself, which we do today, or they would take a stone to rub themselves. They would use what was called a Bayan stone. Bayan Shi stones were excavated from ruins in China. These stones were refined into needle tips. There were nine ancient needles originally made from Bayan stones. You can see the development of the needles from the ancient past to modern day. Today, we use a filiform needle, a solid, one-time use, sterile, stainless steel, disposable acupuncture needle. In the northern cultures, they developed moxa, a form of heat therapy that we even use today. The word acupuncture is actually made up of two words, needles and moxibustion. Our tools have become very refined and sophisticated over the years. The Wang Di Nei Jing, or the Yellow Emperor's Inner Classic, is the earliest surviving text of traditional Chinese medicine a summation of Chinese medical knowledge. Again, here is another legendary divine being. Was Wang Dei Nei Jing real or a supernatural being? We don't know for sure. The most important ancient text in Chinese medicine is this Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine. It departs from the old shamanic beliefs that disease was caused by demonic influences. Instead, the natural effects of diet and lifestyle, emotions, environment, and age are the reasons for diseases developing. The universe is composed of various forces and principles such as yin and yang, qi, the five elements. Humans can stay in balance or return to balance and health by understanding the laws of these natural forces. Human health then is a result of coming into balance with these natural forces. We are not outside of these natural forces but need to live in harmony with them for supreme and optimal health. The Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine describes the relationship also between Twina, back then called Anmo, and acupuncture treatment. Now, Twina is manually pressing the acupuncture points to bring about alleviation of pain or tension. And Twina was a criteria for finding the point. Now, here's a point right here. It's called Lung 7. Lung 7 is on the radial aspect of the forearm in the cleft between the tendons of brachiodalis and abductor pollicis longus. How did they know back in the day where this lung 7 point was if this was during the time period where they found lung 7? Now the lung channel, the external part of the lung channel, runs from the deltoid pectoral triangle all the way down the arm to the thumb and it flows in this direction. Today, if a patient comes to see us and they have a cough, what we do is stick the needle in lung seven and we direct the needle this way against the flow of qi to help stop the cough. In other techniques, you would direct the needle with the flow of qi or with the flow of the channel. Now, how did they know this? This is very sophisticated knowledge. Well, apparently, one of the ways that they found uh, acupuncture points is by doing Twina, or Anmo, because as you're massaging yourself, you get to know your body quite well. It is also said that another way that the ancients realized they had meridians, which are the energy pathways that the acupuncture points are on, is through meditating and through meditating they would feel energy moving in their body somewhat like the experience I described to you whereby I felt energy moving up and down in my body this is something that they were doing 
thousands of years ago and experiencing, but they had refined clearly the visualization process and the meditation process in order to pinpoint each specific meridian. In regards to the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine, it introduces anatomy and physiology, etiology of disease, pathology, diagnosis, prevention. It describes meridians, the function of the organs, nine types of needles, functions of acupuncture points, needling techniques, types of chi, and location of over a hundred different points. Next, let's talk about the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Nothing about this gentleman's life is actually historically documented. We really have no large pieces of evidence showing his life. So again, do we chalk him up to be a supernatural being who came here to infuse the planet with this major text of the art of how to live your potential and be connected to your environment? One of the concepts in the Tao Te Ching is that of non-action, but it doesn't mean don't do anything, like sit in front of the television. Well, back then they didn't have TVs, but it's not about not doing anything. It's, it's about the idea that, let's say, you're, you're a poet and you're writing a poem. Well, in that sense, there's no differentiation between the writer and the poem. The writer and the poem become one. And that's what is meant by the idea of non-action. You are so immersed in the Tao that you are one with the Tao. And so because of that oneness, the Tao is just flowing right through you. And artists of all types experience these high peak moments. And so what's important about this oneness with the Tao and letting it flow through you is that you live your life spontaneously because you're not living from the past or from the future. You're just one with the moment. And that's what's meant both the art of living in the Tao. One of the interesting things, there are many interesting things about this book. Lao Tzu described the perfect person as one who could ascend to the loftiest heights, the real self. And he described how to have contact with the Tao. Now some refer to Lao Tzu as an ascended master. The Tao Te Ching really gives lessons on self-awareness, mindfulness, integrity, how to live in oneness with life, how to be compassionate, how to love, how to live simply and with humility. Now here's a piece from the book, Knowledge and Humility. Knowing others is wisdom. Knowing the self is enlightenment. Mastering others requires force. Mastering the self requires strength. He who knows he is enough is rich. Perseverance is a sign of willpower. He who stays where he is endures. To die but not to perish is to be eternally present. What does that mean? To die but not to perish is to be eternally present. What does that mean? We see this theme in, in other forms of spiritual orientations like Christian mysticism or even Sufism with Rumi, to die laughing, he talks about. Now, in terms of Taoism, here's my spin on it. There's something called the three treasures of man in traditional Chinese medicine. It's called the Jing, the Qi, and the Shen. So you've got the physical body, the emotional body, and then the mind, the consciousness. Now the whole idea of Qi Gong, from a spiritual perspective, was to integrate the Jing, the Qi, and the Shen, the three bodies that composed a human being, so as to transmute and transcend the actual physical body and become one with the stars. And it is even said that Lao Tzu, this is what had happened to him, if he really was a real man walking on this earth. Through their mudras and mantras and dancing star patterns and practicing Qi Gong, masters were able to integrate the Jing, Qi, and Shen, the three treasures of man, and through an alchemic process, ascend into their light bodies to become one uh, with the stars, with the heavens. By contrast, the military, for example, would use Qigong to strengthen the physical body, as opposed to using it as a vessel for immortality. So to die and not to perish really means 
living a life of these virtues that are written in the Tao Te Ching and cultivating a certain mindset and integrating these various aspects within oneself that, so that you're so whole and pure enough that you actually ascend back to the stars, to the place where you came from. All right, let's move along to the warring states in China. Now, during this time, China was divided into different territories or region, and there emerged what was called the first emperor of China because this man united all of these different regions, but he did so through violence and extreme warfare. And it is even said that he actually, because he wanted to control people's thoughts, that he had to burn uh, the ideas. So there was a book burning and, and scholars were killed and that was his way of controlling the, the people. There's actually a documentary on it called The First Emperor of China and uh, it gives a really good historical account of this gentleman. Emperor Qin Shi Hong became China's first emperor when he was 38 after his military conquered all of the other warring states and he unified all of China in 221 BC. Now this first emperor of China is responsible for building the Great Wall in China. And later on in life, he became obsessed with immortality. I mean, think about it. You've conquered this entire, you know, region of China. You've united it all. And now, really, what are you going to do? So he became obsessed with immortality. And he was looking for elixirs, anything that can make him live forever. In this documentary that I watched, uh, The First Emperor of China, it shows him basically having post-traumatic stress syndrome, I would say because now he started reliving all these memories, these horrid memories of all the violence and killings that, that, I mean, thousands of people literally died in his wars. He wanted to continue to live here on earth. And if that wasn't possible, what he did was he created this grave site underground that was found in 1974, I believe. And it was the terracotta warriors. So these huge statues, basically he took his army with him to his death. Excavation sites, revealed these huge, huge statues of his, of his army guarding his burial grave so that they could be with him in, in the spiritual life to protect him um, basically from, from the souls of the people that he brutally murdered and killed um, on planet Earth. Not only were there book burnings during the first emperor of China, but after that, the political landscape sees over the years several other book burnings and even banning of traditional Chinese medicine. Moving forward from the history of traditional Chinese medicine to modern day, in the year 2013 here in the province of Ontario, traditional Chinese medicine finally became regulated meaning that we had to write a, an exam. It was a Canadian-wide exam to get our, our license in order to practice acupuncture in the form of traditional Chinese medicine. Now, oftentimes people will say to me, well, what's the difference between traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and, you know, I go see my chiropractor who also does acupuncture. There's a huge difference. Back in the day when we weren't regulated, People could go to a, a university and do, you know, a weekend course on medical acupuncture, uh, neurological acupuncture. And while we're also trained in that as TCM professionals, we were also trained in numerous hours. I mean, it's a three-year program versus a weekend or so program of the internal medicine part of traditional Chinese medicine. There are layers and layers and layers that we have peeled off and learned as opposed to what someone would learn in a weekend or so course in, in acupuncture. A chiropractor or a physiotherapist who uses needles uh, on their patient, they can't submit an acupuncture bill under insurance because they're not registered as an acupuncturist. So within their scope of practice, they can perform some needling, but it's not traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture needling. In the province of Ontario, acupuncture became regulated in the year 2013 designating it as a controlled act and protecting the title acupuncturist. The traditional Chinese Medicine Act is the profession-specific statute of the College of TCM Practitioners and Acupuncturists of Ontario. The TCM Act works together with the Regulated Health Professions Act so they can be treated as one act. The Regulated Health Professions Act governs 26 health colleges. 
If you'd like to find a traditional Chinese medicine acupuncturist, in Ontario, please go on the website of CTCMPAO. When I first opened my clinic at 84 Lakeshore Road West, I had this canopy sign that said acupuncturist. And one day when I was standing underneath the sign, a, a lady walked by and looked at the sign, looked at me, it was pointing like this, and said, you're the acupuncturist. And I said, yes. And she said, but you're not Chinese. And I said, you know, health does not discriminate. Anyone can learn to practice traditional Chinese medicine. You don't need to be Chinese to do it. In fact, I'm Italian. How can an Italian practice traditional Chinese medicine? Well, one of the greatest figures who brought traditional Chinese medicine from the East to the West was in fact an Italian gentleman named Giovanni Macciocha. And it is his textbooks that are used all over the world today in various school systems so students can learn traditional Chinese medicine and I believe without him and what his efforts did we wouldn't be where we are today in the West in terms of us picking up this knowledge as quickly as we are and so I was actually privileged to do an interview with him while I was a teacher at the Canadian College of Traditional Chinese Medicine I actually sent uh, Mr. Giovanni an email and asked him for an interview and he, he agreed so we set up an interview for my students and we asked him questions he was fantastic so it was really neat to see him answering our questions because here's a man whose textbooks that you know we live and breathe by and really his books set the standards for for the examinations that uh, we have to pass Unfortunately, Mr. Giovanni Macciocha did pass away um, recently. So that's a huge loss for us, really. But he really paved the way for us to be here. And like I said, I, I don't think I would be here knowing what I know about Chinese medicine if it wasn't for his groundbreaking work um, in terms of taking that Eastern knowledge and translating it into the West, into English, something that we can read and actually understand. Compared to when I started, I mean, it's unrecognizable. I mean, when I started, there wasn't a single book in English on Chinese medicine. And I used to go to the Welcome Library in London to read French, French books on, on Chinese medicine. Now there are a lot of classics that have been translated, but there is still a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to do. How did you pick up the language? Because you can read the language, that's why you're translating it, right? Yeah, at that time I studied, I studied, I, ta I taught myself. So what is qi? We talk about qi all the time in Chinese medicine. What is qi? Well, simply it's energy. It's made up of yin and yang energy in its simplest form. And when we talk about organs in the body, for example, the kidney, there's kidney yin and kidney yang. Another example, let's take the liver. Let's say a person has a headache. Well, in Chinese medicine, one of the reasons a person could have a headache, let's say stress. Stress affects the liver yang energy to rise to the head, creating the headache. And so the treatment principle would be to subdue that liver yang energy in order to alleviate the headache. Now the Chinese symbol for qi is rice. So you see rice and the steam rising is the energy of qi, but it also shows the different states that qi can be in, like a solid form or a gaseous form. Ancient TCM saying, if you can understand yin and yang, you can hold the universe in your hands. Yin and yang, universal law, everything in the universe contains yin and yang. They are two opposite yet complementary energies. Yin and yang cannot exist without the other. Yin and yang are the two underlying energies that embody universal law, which ensures that all things remain in harmony. Yin and yang, which exists within us, when we can access this yin and yang energy, we can create a powerful healing technology within us. You can also look at yin and yang energies as the autonomic nervous system. For example, the yang energy is a sympathetic nervous system. It's masculine. And the yin energy is the parasympathetic nervous system. Resting and digesting. Now, how do we know that meridians in the acupuncture points are real? 
So let's talk about the energy system. Let's talk about meridians and acupuncture points. What is a meridian? What's an acupuncture point? Meridians are energetic pathways in the body that can access organs. They can be thought of as a highway, while acupuncture points along each meridian can be thought of as bus stops. When an acupuncture stimulates an acupuncture point, that stimulation helps to regulate the meridian and return it to a state of balance. When a person's energy field is out of harmony, disease or sickness develops. There are over 300 acupuncture points on the body. Now each acupuncture point has its own function. For example, spleen 9. It's on the medial side of the lower leg in a depression in the angle formed by the medial condyli of the tibia and the posterior border of the tibia. How do you needle it? Perpendicular insertion, 1 to 1.5 chun. What are the actions? Well, it regulates the spleen, resolves dampness, opens water passages, and helps with abdominal distension. Clinical applications include edema, swelling of the knee and lower limbs, and retention of urine. Now, how do we know meridians are real? Well, one study that was done used an infrared camera and heat therapy, amoxibustion. And what happened was actually incredible. The camera caught the heat lighting up meridians. Using an infrared camera, heat radiation of the human body can be recorded and analyzed. The method used here demonstrates that after burning a moxibustion stick as a directed heat source in a defined manner in proximity to a body region where there is purported to be an acupuncture point, the meridian structure can be completely revealed. Box A and B shows the stomach and spleen meridians on the legs being revealed. Figure 2 shows the stomach meridian along the chest and abdomen being revealed and figure three shows a bladder meridian on the back of the legs. TCM views the body as multi-layered, from the most superficial to the most deep layers we have, cutaneous, minute, sinew, loop connecting, primary meridians, extraordinary channels, divergent channels, and deeper pathways of the primary and divergent channels. For example, look at the lung channel and see all of its systems. Now how does qi flow? We've been talking a lot about qi. Where does it flow? How does it flow? Well, it does flow, and it flows in many different directions. So, for example, spleen chi flows up, stomach chi flows down. And let's say you're belching, for example. We would call that rebellious stomach chi, because stomach chi is supposed to flow down. When it starts to flow up, that becomes a problem. So there are specific ways qi is supposed to flow depending on its meridian or organ. And when it doesn't flow in that direction, then there are problems. So the lung qi descends down towards the kidneys and ascends to diffuse defensive qi and sweat. Liver qi ascends, controls smooth flow of qi in all directions. Kidney qi also ascends and it ascends to the lungs and sometimes it descends for urination purposes. Heart qi descends to meet with the kidney qi which ascends. Now, unhealthy movements of qi now, when spleen qi moves down, you'll have, for example, diarrhea. Stomach qi, when it moves up, you'll have vomiting, for example. Lung qi, when it fails to descend, there could be asthma. When liver qi stagnates, well, you could have an abdominal cramp. When liver qi stagnates, the end result could actually be an abdominal tumor, but that's on the extreme end. When kidney qi fails to ascend, you could have edema, and when heart qi fails to descend, there could be heart disease. Functions of qi, well, Qi has many functions. Spleen qi not holding blood, you could have varicose veins. Defensive qi protects the body, and that equals a strong immune system. When your defensive qi is weak, your immune system may be weak. Kidney qi, for example, raises the uterus so that there's no prolapse. When there's a prolapse, then there's something wrong with the function of the kidney qi, for example. So each organ has qi, and that qi within that organ or meridian has its own function. And when it's not running or operating according to its function, then there's health concerns. Let's talk about patients. Maybe you're a patient. Maybe you want to be a patient of a traditional Chinese medicine acupuncturist. What's the first step? Well, the first step is, you know, coming into to the clinic. And so what happens to you when you come into a clinic? Well, you're going to be given an intake form so that we can see your medical and health history and then we're going to do a TCM assessment that includes for example looking at your tongue and checking your pulse so as to see the distribution of energy within your organs and meridians. Then we're going to come up with a TCM treatment plan and on that day we are likely to implement that plan while you're there. 
So what are some of the modalities that we can use to help you while you come to us for treatment? Well, there's acupuncture, so using the needles, there's cupping, there's gua sha, moxibustion, uh, qigong prescriptions, nutrition prescriptions, and if you're a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, you're able to give herbs. Now, let's talk about tongue diagnosis for a moment. Everybody, not everybody, but most of my patients, you know, chuckle or laugh when I ask them for the first time to stick out their tongue. Because it, 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 it just sounds funny, and it actually and it can look funny too for the person. But what does the tongue tell us? Well, it tells us several things. In order to understand what it tells us, we really need to first understand what a healthy tongue looks like. Characteristics of a normal or healthy tongue include it being soft, subtle, it extends easily. There's no cracks, it's not too thin, it's not swollen, it doesn't quiver. The color is a pale red or pink, the coating is thin, it's white, and it's uh, slightly moist. As acupuncturists, we see a variety of tongues. Here's some examples of people not living up to their health potential when looking at their tongue. Now you know what a healthy tongue should be. So when a tongue is not healthy, there's going to be different kinds of combinations. For example, one that you're probably familiar with is if you have uh, a cold or a flu, you'll see a thick white coating on your tongue. It'll actually cover the majority of the tongue. And as you get better, that thickness of that white coating will start to decrease and it'll shrink showing that you're getting better, you're, you're overcoming the flu or the cold. Sometimes the tongue can be pale, so it indicates a blood deficiency. Sometimes the tongue can be red, uh, indicating stagnation of blood or energy. The tongue can also quiver, showing that there's wind in the body. There's different things that can happen to the tongue, and these are all things that we're looking at. So we're looking at the tongue body color, the, the shape of the tongue, if it's swollen, if it's short, if it's long. We're also looking at the coating of the tongue. What color is it? Is it white? Is it yellow? If it's yellow, there's probably heat in the body. Is it thick? Is it thin? The information that we gather for diagnosis includes the tongue, uh, the pulse, um, the, the presentation of the person, the person's story, for example. There's even facial uh, diagnosis that is used in traditional Chinese medicine. Also, um, when we palpate a person, that can give us more data in terms of the distribution of energy that's happening within certain meridians and, and acupuncture points. Similar to the tongue, when we look at the tongue, the pulse also shows a distribution of energy or qi and the various meridians or organs. And there's over 20 different pulse types in traditional Chinese medicine. It's very different than Western biomedical medicine in terms of how they take a person's pulse. So the characteristics of a healthy pulse include it's moderate. You know, there's like four beats per respiration. It's not slow, it's not fast. It has a stomach qi, it's soft, it's gentle, it's calm. It has spirit, we would say. It's regular, it's soft and it has root. You can feel it on the deep and third level. When you put the data of the tongue and pulse together, what can that tell you? Well, here's an example. So when you look at the tongue, the sides are reserved for the liver. And let's say the color is, is a deep red, so there's stagnation of energy there. And the liver is supposed to have a smooth flow of energy in all directions. That's how it's supposed to flow. When you see the redness on the sides, you know that energy is not flowing smoothly in all directions within the body. So there's an issue there. Now, when you feel the pulse and you feel it in the liver position, it'll feel stringy, like a guitar string, and we call that wiry. So that, again, that feeling of just tightness and stagnation, like you're just uh, like irritated or, or angry or frustrated, that's indicative of the liver, the stagnation, the wiry, and so a treatment principle would be to smooth the liver energy so that it flows more nicely throughout the body and the person feels better. And the person is not tense or, or wound up, but rather more calm and relaxed. <music> When the acupuncturist uses needles, there are various things to consider. For example, um, when you look at a point, or when you're about to put a needle in a point, you need to know uh, the direction of the needle, you need to know the depth of the needle, 
You need to know how to properly pull the needle out when you're finished, if you're going to close the chi hole after or not. You also need to know when the needle's in, are you going to turn it one way versus the other way? Are you going to tonify the energy or subdue the energy? So all these things come into play when you stick a needle in an acupuncture point. In classic acupuncture, there are several factors to consider based on TCM diagnosis. Needle insertion, withdrawing, rotation, depth of penetration, open or closing the hole, and so forth. Tonifying techniques strengthen a deficient meridian, for example. For sedating techniques, stimulation is used to harmonize hyperactive meridians. There's also a technique called surrounding the dragon, and we use this, for example, in cases of inflammation or skin diseases, where needles actually surround the challenged area. When it comes to acupuncture, I get asked, do those needles hurt? And my response is, it doesn't have to hurt. I'm going to do a demonstration here so you get the idea of what needle insertion could be like on your body when you go to an acupuncturist. So we have some alcohol and we have some needles. First off, I washed my hands. It's called the clean needle technique. We take the alcohol, we put it on the area that we're going to needle. And then we use these one-time disposable needles. So they're never used again on another person. And these needles, uh, this one has a tube on it, as you can see. Some of them come tubeless. The tube helps to guide the needle in. So here we go. I'm going to put the needle right here. This is actually a point. It's called large intestine 11. And we just tap it in and insert. There you go. Used needles actually go in this biohazard box. I think what's fascinating about traditional Chinese medicine, well, I, I think it's all fascinating, actually, but one of the things is how they view the body. It's viewed as a hologram where every part contains the whole. This is like quantum thinking. So there's all these little microsystems in traditional Chinese medicine, like auricular therapy, the ear, where there's certain points. You could actually, you know, put needles in certain points of the ear and tell people quit smoking, for example. So there's like a lung point, uh, you know, an addiction point, for example. Um, there's also what's called scalp acupuncture. So on the head, various parts of the body, like the arm, the leg, are mapped out on the head. Again, every part contains a whole. This idea of holographic thinking, of quantum mechanics, you know, the way they thought about the body thousands of years ago, it's mind-blowing, really. When we talk about acupuncture points, there's points that help to stimulate a certain meridian. So again, for example, lung seven helps with the lung meridian. There's also extra points in acupuncture that are outside of these meridians. For example, there's a point right here called Bei Chang Wu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and it helps with skin problems like itchiness. And it's an extra point, it's not on a meridian. Another point would be yin tong. And again, that's not on a meridian. Another extra point would be tai yong. So there's all these extra points in addition to the points used to stimulate the meridians. There are literally like hundreds of points all over the body. And it wasn't until I actually studied acupuncture that I knew that these points actually existed on my body. And in some cases you can feel them as little crevices, little indentations in the body. And again, for me, I find that so fascinating how thousands of years ago, I mean, how did they know? How did they just feel like, oh, there's a point? It's such a sophisticated form of healing acupuncture in the perspective of traditional Chinese medicine. Another technique that we use is cupping. I use this a lot, actually, in my practice. And what it does is it sucks up the skin like that and what that suction does is it helps to disperse the tension or the stagnation of chi and blood that's creating pain or tension in the body it's really good for myofascia release where you have knots in the skin it helps to disperse those like immediately i found in my practice so the cups come in different sizes depending on different body areas that you put it on you can actually even Put the cups on the face. I've used this several times when I've had a patient with Bell's palsy just to try and improve the circulation on the face. There's also fire cupping 
where the heat creates the suction inside of the cup. And so when the cups are on the person's body, you can keep them there like stationary, or if you put oil on the person's back, you can actually move the cups up and down. And it's actually, it feels like a massage. It's very relaxing for patients. People get cupping for many purposes, including to help with pain, inflammation, blood flow, relaxation, and well-being, and as a type of deep tissue massage. It is effective at stretching tight fascia and muscles. These are some gua sha tools. So we also use gua sha in traditional Chinese medicine, and it's a scraping action. Again, like cupping, it helps to promote microcirculation in the body to help relieve tension and pain. It's really good um, to get into the neck area. Oftentimes the cups I find are a bit awkward using them in the neck area, so I use the gua sha a lot in people's neck areas. And these days with everybody pretty much working in an office in front of a computer, I see lots of people with neck and shoulder tension. So I use a combination of the cups and the gua sha. Electroacupuncture is another device we use, and basically it's the application of a pulsating electric current to acupuncture needles as a means of stimulating acupuncture points. It was developed in China as an extension of hand manipulation of acupuncture needles around 1934. The duration of standard treatment with electroacupuncture is about 10 to 20 minutes. So in what cases would you use the electrical acupuncture versus not? A Bell's palsy, for example, on the face, you want to increase that circulation on the face, and I found that the electrical acupuncture really helps in that type of situation. I've also used the electrical acupuncture on people's knees, for example, again, to improve the blood flow and circulation to help bring healing to the tissue in that area. Let's look at moxibustion. It's a heat therapy, and we use it today in practice. Oftentimes, you see it as uh, smoke. Today, we have various versions of moxibustion. It's actually uh, from the mugwort tree. We have sprays today, we have ointments today, so we don't necessarily have to use the smoking moxibustion if we don't want to because the smell, unless you have good ventilation in your clinic, I would suggest using a smokeless version of the moxa, but it's a form of heat therapy, so it helps to warm the meridian channels. So for example, uh, for infertility, if the uterus is cold, as we would say in traditional Chinese medicine, we would use moxibustion to help heat up or warm up um, that uterus, so that's more fertile. Moxibustion also helps to tonify qi or energy and improve circulation. There's various conditions under which an acupuncturist would choose to use moxibustion during a treatment. Also part of traditional Chinese medicine is the TDP lamp. The TDP lamp features a round plate coated with a proprietary mineral formation consisting of 33 elements essential to the human body. When it's activated, the mineral plate emits a special band of electromagnetic waves that coincide with the wavelengths and intensity of the electromagnetic waves released by a human body and consequently are absorbed by the human body. This absorption is therapeutic. Tweena massage. Tweena is a manual therapy that stimulates the acupuncture points along the meridians that can be viewed as a form of acupressure massage and myofascia release. Some of the benefits is that it increases microcirculation, stimulates lymphatic system, activates acupuncture points, regulates the flow of qi and blood, clears the meridians of obstructions, relaxes tissues and muscles, and alleviates pain. Let's move on and talk about traditional Chinese medicine, nutrition. Okay, for example, let's say you have blood stasis and that translates to a frozen shoulder. What type of food would you prescribe for your patient? Well, you want to move the blood. So something like turmeric, for example, would be good to help move that blood to break up that stagnation. And you would suggest avoiding cold foods because cold foods constrict in the body. One of the ways that we suggest certain foods in traditional Chinese medicine is based on diagnosis and the TCM pattern that we have diagnosed the person with. From that pattern, then we determine the type of food that would be beneficial to treat that pattern. Again, blood stasis, you want to move the blood. You don't want to keep the blood frozen or constricted. So you have to think of, of foods that will help to move blood as opposed to keeping it tight and constricted. Nutrition is also based on the five element theory in traditional Chinese medicine. 
For example, the wood element is the springtime. Well, in the spring, we want to eat green foods like artichokes and avocados. Now, the meridians here are the liver and the gallbladder. In the summer season, the element is fire. The meridians are the heart and the small intestine. And the color here is red, so the foods you want to eat are tomatoes, strawberries, rhubarb, and beets. In the Indian summer season, we have the earth element, and the color is yellow. The meridians are the spleen and the stomach, so foods look like pumpkin, squash, pine nuts, and sweet potato. In the fall season, we have the metal element. The meridians, or the organs, are the large intestine and the lung. The color is white, so foods include onion, garlic. In the winter season, it's the water element, and the meridians or organs are the kidney and bladder. The color is dark blue or black, so the foods are like bass or black beans. I think in the West, people know traditional Chinese medicine to help with physical ailments. For example, you know, neck stiffness, shoulder tension, lumbago, like low back pain, sciatica, knee pain, tennis elbow, frozen shoulder, things of that, of a physical uh, nature. And yes, traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture is amazing at helping those conditions, for sure. And there's been a lot of research studies that show the clinical effectiveness of using acupuncture for physical conditions. I think what's less known about using traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture is that it's used for emotional disturbances. So within our scope of practice, we're actually allowed to treat depression and anxiety, for example. The way we view emotions is that it's a form of energy, so it's a form of energetic imbalance. It's very different than how psychologists in the West look at emotions and mental health, for example. And I can say that because my background, I do have a doctorate degree in psychology, so I can understand the two and see how they are different and how they treat mental illness. One views mental illness as, as uh, an imbalance in energy in the meridians, whereas the other looks at mental illness um, through belief structures, for example. Now, how do we treat emotions in traditional Chinese medicine? There's a variety of combinations. Um, we need to look at what's causing the emotion. So for example, anger. How do you treat anger in traditional Chinese medicine? Well, the etiology could be stress, right? Stress. And the stress creates liver chi stagnation, which is the traditional Chinese medicine pattern. And that stagnation creates anger. So the treatment principle in that pathogenesis there is to smooth the flow of the liver chi so it's not stagnated anymore. Another example would be someone who overthinks a lot. So if you're overthinking a lot, you're worried, I mean, that's going to create anxiety in the body at some point. So if you're overthinking a lot, that's going to consume your spleen chi, for example. And that consumption of spleen chi is going to lead to spleen chi deficiency. And so in that case, what we need to do is to tonify your spleen chi. So there's various ways of looking at emotions in Chinese medicine, and each meridian has its own um, emotions. So the liver is anger, frustration. The spleen is worry and overthinking. The kidney is fear, for example. The lung is sadness or grief. And there's different protocols that you could use to help the body release those emotions, those stored, stuck emotions that are stored and stuck in the tissue, you can help to release that energy by using uh, various sizes of needles and placing them in certain acupuncture points in the body. When we talk about emotional release, when you look at this photo, you can see the redness around the needle. And so these emotions, this energy is being released. Um, that saying the issues are in your tissues, well, it's true. I mean, the issues are in your tissues, and when you, you look at acupuncture and when you see these, this energy being released, you can see why people say issues are in your tissues. Vitality Magazine actually published an article that I wrote on how acupuncture and cupping can help to ease emotional pain. So if you haven't read it, get your copy of Vitality Magazine. It's in the May 2017 edition. 
how does traditional Chinese medicine work in terms of Western medicine? Like, where can we see similarities? One way is the circulatory system. Another is the muscular skeletal system, neurological explanation, and the immune system explanation. Let's talk about these in some more detail. Circulatory explanation. Well, acupuncture stimulates the body's innate ability to heal. For example, by bringing blood and chi to a distressed area. Blood and chi is filled with nutrients to help heal damaged tissue. The neurological explanation. Well, acupuncture stimulates the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the limbic cortex, the sensory cortex. Now, this AS system releases neurochemicals like beta endorphins and kinephalin that help to suppress pain. These are the body's natural pain killers. The musculoskeletal explanation. While some acupuncture points are located at trigger points in the muscles, these are often painful areas that do get relief when they are massaged or, in the acupuncturist's case, needle. Some of the important points are actually at motor points, which is where the nerve innervates the muscles. Now, let's look at the immune system explanation. Research shows some acupuncture points do increase white blood cells to help the immune system. Acupuncture affects the relaxation of the fight flight response, the sympathetic nervous system, and promotes the restorative nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. In traditional Chinese medicine, as an acupuncturist, our scope of practice, it's fairly large. We can treat internal issues, external issues, for example, like the common cold, we can help with that. We can help with acne, for example. We can help with muscle issues. We can help with emotional issues. Uh, so if you're not sure whether an acupuncturist can help you, just give them a call or send, you know, a certain acupuncturist an email. How about we move into some self-acupressure? I think that's a good idea at this point in the video. Quite often, patients come to me asking, can acupuncture help with emotional issues? Can acupuncture help with my anxiety, my fear, my sadness, my depression, my grief? And the answer is yes, absolutely, acupuncture can help alleviate emotional conditions. It's well within our scope of practice. Today, I'd like to share with you an acupressure point, something that you can do at home since you can't needle yourself. You'd actually have to come to the clinic for acupuncture, but here's some acupressure just for you. So I'm going to introduce you to a point. It's called Neguan in traditional Chinese medicine or PC6, pericardium 6. This point can help to alleviate anxiety, alleviate irritation, help to calm and ground the shen, as they say in Chinese medicine, ground and calm your consciousness. Here's how you find the point. Take three fingers on one hand, look at the other hand, match it up to the wrist crease. You're going to find that there's two tendons here, the palmaris longus and flexor carpi radialis. The point is in between the two tendons. So once you line up your three fingers, go to the last finger here, and here you're going to find the point. What you want to do is massage this point. Start off gently and slow, go in a circular motion, and then with each circular motion, just go deeper and deeper into the tissue. Go deeper and deeper into that point, and just allow that point to be activated to help calm you, to help ground you, to help you feel good. This point is located bilaterally. I see a lot of people with back pain, especially lower back pain, so I wanted to share a tip with you, an at-home tip. Now, in the clinic, I use acupuncture and sometimes cupping therapy to help relieve back pain, but there's something that you can do at home, and it's called acupressure. There's multiple points on the body, and they have different functions, and there's actually points for lumbar pain. So this is something you can do or have a friend do to you. There's no side effects, and it actually feels really good. Okay, so there's four points, two on each hand, so they're bilateral. Now, how you're going to find these points is like this. You're going to look at your second and third metacarpal and your fourth and fifth metacarpal, and you're actually going to move two fingers all the way down, just distal to the base of the metacarpals. And you're going to find within this indentation, that's right, just slide those fingers down, there's an indentation too. These are the two points. So what you want to do is start by gently massaging the points in a circular fashion. Go deeper and deeper into the tissue with each circular motion. Now you can do this for a few minutes throughout the day. And like I said, it's great if you have a friend to do this for you. So you can sit back, relax, and allow the energy, the chi, 
to unblock the stagnant energy that is causing you tension or pain. Oftentimes, I see patients that come in with a stiff neck, a lot of tension that they're carrying in their neck, and I will use acupuncture needles along with cupping therapy and some gua sha to help relieve that tension, to get that chi flowing, the energy flowing in the body, because the energy needs to move. Now, here's a quick tip that you can actually do at home, and it's safe. There's no side effects to it, and actually it feels really good. I'm going to introduce you to an acupressure point specifically designed for a stiff neck, and here is how you find it. Take your hand, look at the second and third metacarpal. The point is actually proximal to the second and third metacarpal phalangal joint, so you're almost creating an equilateral triangle right here. You can feel an indentation. Now, take a, another finger and just massage that point. It's great if you can actually have a friend do this for you. So what you want to do is go in a circular motion, massaging that point. Start off gently and go deeper and deeper into the tissue. You can do this several times a day for a couple of minutes until you feel some relief. For online booking, please check out my website, marconiacupuncture.com. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video on traditional Chinese medicine. And I hope you've learned something and I hope it's inspired you to seek out an acupuncturist and to um, create good health for yourself. Please do some research and look up everything I said to help educate yourself even further. And feel free to send me an email if you'd like and ask me questions about this video as well.